Hi, this is Pastor Brian Ketchelmeyer, and I'm here to give you some more vitamin OT. Now, again, what I mean by that is some Old Testament scripture supplement to help you in your OT deficiency. Uh, we'll talk for about 10 minutes or so in the Old Testament. Now, today's topic is going to be finding Christ. Now, it's not like Christ is lost or anything. Instead, understand with me the game of hide-and-go-seek when you have a parent playing with a toddler and the parent wants to be found. So the parent goes and hides, and the voice goes out throughout the house, and the child toddles, as a toddler, get it? <laughs> toddler toddles, toddles over to the voice trying to find the parent, but the parent wants to be found. Well, Christ, of course, wants to be found in the Old Testament, telling us that it's the same God in the beginning, now, and in the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the Holy Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is the Son alone who comes to seek and to save the lost by taking upon our human nature and dwelling among us in the flesh. Now, let's go ahead and get started. Now, we want to understand that there are going to be rules for reading the Old Testament scriptures. Now, we have put in place five different rules for reading the Old Testament scriptures. The first rule or the first order that we want to use here is that we should read the Old Testament scriptures recognizing that it, the Old Testament scriptures, testifies about Christ. Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So these are the words of Jesus teaching us about the Old Testament, the Law, and the Prophets. Now, furthermore, in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus has already been crucified, and on the third day he rises again from the dead in the body, he comes back to his apostles before he sends them out, and he tells them this in Luke 24. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That the entire Old Testament scripture is about Jesus. The promises of God are all fulfilled in Jesus, in his person and work, what he comes to do to restore creation in the incarnation. Now we continue. In Psalm 40 in the Old Testament, for instance, we see this very clearly when we read the psalm as the psalm of Jesus. In, in fact, the entire Psalter is a divine drama in which Jesus is the perfect fulfiller of the role of each one of these psalms. So he picks up the psalm and he reads it as the one the psalm is talking about. These are his words that he now takes as the incarnate psalm. So it's in Psalm 40 where Jesus makes this comment and he says, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. Now that's how we want to read the Old Testament scriptures as written of Jesus. Now moving right along to our next section, we want to have an understanding of this rule. Read the Old Testament, that is the it part, in the same way that the apostles read it. That again is the it, the scripture. Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. Remember in Luke chapter 24, that's when Jesus, who is resurrected, he tells the disciples, his apostles, that everything written about him is now fulfilled. Now we continue here at Luke 24 with these words. Then he, that of course would be Christ, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Whoops, we don't want to cross out the scriptures. We want to highlight the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. Now, it's the apostles that are sent out from Jerusalem to proclaim the fulfillment of all the promises of the Messiah in Jesus of Nazareth. 
So they go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. In the book of Acts, we have the account of how the apostolic church proclaimed this message. For example, in Acts chapter 3, we have the sermon of Peter. Now, Peter the apostle says this, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Again, you see that same message that Jesus himself was giving. He thus fulfilled. Likewise, later on in the book of Acts, now you have the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul went into the synagogue, the place where the scriptures are read on a weekly basis on the Sabbath, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. And to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Now again, in the book of Acts in chapter 18, once more we have the Apostle Paul proclaiming and preaching Christ crucified. And this is what Paul says as he proclaims the scriptures of the Old Testament. Saying this, uh, or this is actually an account of Paul speaking <laughs> for he, that, that's Paul. <laughs> <laughs> this is Luke telling us what Paul said. So he, Paul, powerfully refuted the Jews. That's the rabbis who reject Jesus. In public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Now that's what the Apostle Paul did, according to Luke's account. Now, we also want to look at this next rule this rule here is that we read it, that's the scripture of the Old Testament, realizing that it is not merely a catalog of future promises about the coming Christ, which it is, but rather, it's even more important than that. It was Christ present and active in those days. It's not like Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, didn't exist until the New Testament. What we have in the New Testament is we see the fulfillment of the promise of the Incarnation. That's what we have in the New Testament. That at the proper time, that one was born under the woman, born under the law, to reverse the curse, to save us from our sin. Now let's look at John chapter 1. Now I want you to notice here that in John chapter 1 it says, No one has ever seen God. Now the passage goes on to say that the only God, now this is really the only, I should put, the only begotten God. Now who's the only begotten God? That's the Son, the Son of God. You have the eternal Father who is unbegotten, and you have the eternal Son who is eternally begotten. So the only begotten God that, of course, is the Son, the Word of God, the eternal Logos, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now, this is a very important passage to understand in the New Testament so that we can properly understand the whole of the Old Testament. You see, no one has ever seen God. But yet, when we look at the Old Testament, we see people seeing God all the time. In fact, in Exodus chapter 24, here's an example where we have names. We name them. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu. And not only that, but 70 of the elders of Israel went up and what happened? They saw God, the God of Israel. It was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. And we know in the Old Testament, the saints, the patriarchs, saw God. Well, John tells us that no one has ever seen the Father. Instead, they have seen the Son. The Son of God is the one who always makes the Father known. So every time God appears in the Old Testament, this is the Son being sent by the Father to seek and to save the lost. This is the one who comes pointing to the Incarnation. That he is the one sent to take upon flesh and blood. He is the one who comes to die in order to redeem us and to reconcile us. Now let's continue in John's Gospel. John chapter 8. Now this is what Jesus says. 
Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now, we want to note here that when Jesus said that Abraham saw his day, immediately the Jews, that would be the rabbis, the teachers, the leaders who reject Jesus, they said to him, wait a second, hold on, hold your horses. You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? I mean, that's the question. Have you seen Abraham? Well, Jesus answers them. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He is the one who is. He is Yahweh, the being, the one who is from the beginning, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, and is to come. And so, now notice that this is what's taking place here, that they know the claim that Jesus is making. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 12, we have an account where Abraham saw God. Again, who did he see? He saw the only begotten God, the Son of God. So when it says, then Yahweh, or the Lord, appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So Abraham, that's Abraham, Abraham, built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now again, who is this? This is the son, the son who was seen in the Old Testament. He's the one who makes the father known. Now let's go back to uh, uh, John. John chapter 12. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So now notice what John is telling us, that not only has Abraham seen Jesus, but likewise, Isaiah has seen Jesus. Well, when did Isaiah see Jesus? Well, <laughs> that's very simple. In Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is Isaiah who saw the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, finally, in our last rule that we want here to help us understand the reading of the Old Testament and finding Jesus, as my words are finding themselves off the screen, we have this rule. Read it, again, the it being the Old Testament scripture, with the understanding that God was rejected by his own people who refused to listen to his word. Now, Jesus is the incarnate word of God. As he was rejected in the Old Testament scriptures, so too he was rejected in the New Testament scriptures. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, once again, let's go back to John's gospel. John chapter 5. Jesus is speaking. So this is Jesus. So Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness of me, Jesus. Yet you refuse to come to me, Jesus, that you may have life. Now notice in John chapter 5, he continues on and he says this at verses 46 through 47. Jesus is still speaking. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how? How will you believe my words? Now let's look at those words of Moses. In particular, we want to see Deuteronomy chapter 18. Again, we don't want to cross out God's word. We want to highlight God's word. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 18. And this is what Moses writes. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see the great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right. In what they have spoken, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, the you here being Moses, from among their brothers, and I 
will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I shall require it of him. Again, here's the person of the Father speaking of the person of the Son. The Son is the one who is incarnate. The Father sends the Son. The Son speaks what the Father gives him to speak. And just like in the Old Testament, when they rejected the Word of God, they rejected the Word incarnate in the New Testament. Now, this takes us down to uh, rule number five. Uh, yeah, actually, this is rule number five. Before was rule number four. <laughs> so this is rule number five. Before was number four. Read it. That's the Old Testament scriptures comprehending that, they re that the revealed knowledge of salvation is the same message given to us in the New Testament scriptures as it is in the Old Testament scriptures. <laughs> so it's the same. So to him... All the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. Now that's Acts chapter 10. Likewise, we have this understanding all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, that's Christ, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, who's the he? That's Christ. And Christ, of course, is the child born of the virgin who will crush the serpent's head. Now, that, prom prom uh, that promise is given to Adam and Eve. And when Eve conceives and has her first son, she believes she's got the one. In fact, in Genesis chapter 4, she says, <laughs> Now, Adam and Eve knew each, other, uh, knew each other in the biblical sense. She conceived and bore Cain and saying, I have gotten Yahweh the man. She thought she had the Christ child, the one who brings salvation. Now, throughout the whole book of Genesis, we wait for that Christ child. We wait for the Savior. We wait for the salvation of Yahweh. And like I said before, all of the children of Adam and Eve, they come and they go, and we're waiting for the one who is the eternal one, Christ our Lord. Now, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, we have that promise told to us very clearly that he's going to suffer and die. He's a suffering servant. So out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by the knowledge of him. The him, of course, is Christ. Shall the righteous, the Christ. That's actually mistranslated. <laughs> this, this should be by the knowledge of him. That here, here's where I actually am going to cross this out. By the knowledge of him, the righteous one, my servant, he shall make, this is the, he shall make many to be accounted righteous. That would be justified. And he shall bear their iniquity. Likewise, in Isaiah 45, uh, I should test these uh, translations before I put them here, of course. But in Isaiah 45, in the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. And likewise, in Jeremiah, the prophet, chapter 23, in his days, that's the Christ, Judah will be saved. Whoops, I'm crossing out words instead of highlighting words. Again, we highlight the scripture, shall be saved. He will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. He is Yahweh, our righteousness. You see, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is our righteousness. So in the Old Testament scripture, we understand that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Until next time, see you later.